Christmas, everybody, and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we are delighted to have you joining us this morning. If you've just arrived, why not leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well, or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, eagrm.org. Just drop us a line, and we'll get back to you right away. Now it's just about time for Sunday morning to get started. So if you haven't already, why don't you grab a Bible, get some coffee, and let's get ready for another incredible morning of worshiping God and hearing from His Word at Online Church. Again, folks, welcome again to EAG Church, and as you see, we're here back in our studio for this month of December as we go through the Christmas narrative, uh, so that we're so glad that you're tuning in. You know, Christmas is called the season of Advent. It's a season of hope. Advent means coming or arrival. It was when they were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, so it was expectation and anticipation and waiting, and it, and it starts with the fourth Sunday before Christmas, which is today. And so it looks back at the hope that was fulfilled in Christ when he did come, but yet we look forward to a second coming, which in the light of what's happening in our world today, it seems like it will be no time soon. In a season that's often pretty hectic with hustle and bustle, Advent is that opportunity, I hope, 
that you will take it seriously just to prepare your hearts and, and place your focus on a far greater story than what's happening in our life. And that's the story of God's redeeming love for the world. During World War I, the newspapers ran the story of a letter found in the pocket of a soldier who had been killed in action. As his pockets were emptied and mailed to his mother, these words were found by her written on the back of a letter. And it said the greatest verse in the Bible, which we would know as John 3.16. And she had broken it down like this, For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest love, the world, the greatest audience, that he gave the greatest event, Christmas, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest offer, believeth in him, which is the greatest simplicity, should not perish, the greatest security, but have everlasting life, the greatest possession that we could ever have. So as we begin uh, our Christmas messages this year, I want you to turn with me to a verse that's not often associated with the Christmas narrative, but it's a good one. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. And, and this is Paul speaking, and it says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now, this, this was written by the Apostle Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Before he was converted, he, he was trained under the rabbi Gamaliel. He was a master of the Greek language. He was a capable communicator. He wrote about half the New Testament, and yet he pauses when he comes to this simple four-letter word, gift, because he cannot find one prefix that would be adequate to portray God's grace. So he simply says it's indescribable. Now, what you don't know is when Paul chooses that word, that word is not anywhere else in Scripture that I can find. We, we would say today that he coined a new word, God's indescribable gift. Now, the title of my sermon series for these next several weeks is Some Gifts Are More Than Just a Gift. Some Gifts Are More Than Just a Gift. When Michael Jordan got a basketball, I would say it was more than just a gift. When Babe Ruth got his first baseball bat, I would say it was more than just a gift. It became their life work. They're, they're known for the occupation, the sports they played, that, that had to do with those gifts. So what does Benjamin Franklin's kite, Tom Brady's first football, Sidney Crosby's first pair of skates, Richard Petty's first car, Billy Graham's Bible, Joshua Bell's violin, David Sling, all have in common? They were more than just a gift. These things were life-changing in their life, and we have stories and remembrances of them because these gifts that they were given became part of their life's calling. Now, if you were to ask anyone what's the most joyful time of the year, I would suspect without question it would be Christmas. It should be Christmas, and it can be Christmas, especially if what we are really celebrating is the birth of Christ, God's indescribable gift. But yet so many people don't seem to find that joy because they're tied up in other things. In 1719, Isaac Watts wrote a hymn that came to be entitled Joy to the World. The interesting thing about this song is the only stanza that relates to Christmas and the birth of Jesus is the first one that announces the Lord has come. There's no mention in that song of Mary, Joseph, the angels, the shepherd, the manger, the wise men, yet it's one of the most beloved Christmas carols because it captures the essence of Christmas, which is joy. So the first gift that I want to talk about today that's more than just a gift this Christmas is God's gift of joy. Now I know that we just came off a series in the book of Philippians. We talked a lot about joy. So I thought it would be, this would be a good first gift to talk about. Now joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of every detail in my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything will be right and the determined choice to praise God in all things. Watts was right when he entitled his carol Joy to the World because Christmas is not just a national joy. It's not just a cultural joy. It's not just for the rich or the educated. It's not an emotional joy or a physical joy. It's a universal joy. And if there is any word that is supposed to describe the Christian life, it's joy. When Christ was born, the very first thing the angel said to the shepherds watching their flocks by night in Luke chapter 2 is, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The angel did not say that this will cause great faith or great love or great peace, 
but great joy. So let's pray before we launch in. Father, this is your mighty holy word. This is the wonderful Christmas story. Lord, we all mostly know the characters. We know uh, the events, the places. We know the story. But Father, I pray that today, that through this story, you'll bring life to us. You'll, you'll bring joy into our hearts. You'll open up those avenues that we can see clearly, Lord, what, 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 what happened and what you're doing in our life and what you want to do today. In Christ's name, amen. So in the biblical account of the Christmas story, joy is mentioned eight times. The arrival of Jesus is the most joyful event in history, I would say. So I want to look at four things about joy that I find in the Christmas story. And I'm going to weave this theme of joy through many of the characters that we often talk about. Number one is this. Joy is life-changing. It's life-changing, and for several reasons. Number one, joy overcomes shame and disgrace. Luke 1 tells the story of Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. They were the parents of John the Baptist, who, who, sent, who was sent to prepare the way for the Lord. Zechariah was a priest who received a visit from an angel that told him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. Now, I've always mentioned this when I talk about this. is This couple is old. They're not supposed to have kids at this age of life. So... so when, when the angel says, this is an answer to prayer, is this a recent prayer? Or, or are the angels finally catching up to the prayer they prayed when they were younger? I don't know. Verse 14 of Luke 1 says, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. So I want to look at Elizabeth a little bit, because to understand the joy that, that she's about to experience in a big measure, we've got to first understand a little bit about her shame. Okay? And so to understand that, we, we, I want to throw a verse out here, Psalm 127. It says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So, so children uh, allowed the family name and heritage to be passed on. They provided more hands to take care of the daily task of life on, you know, the, the agricultural life that they live. More importantly, children were viewed as a gift from God and a sign of his favor. So to be childless was a source of great frustration, sorrow, and for a woman it was shame. And Elizabeth would have known this despair for years because year after year when she could have had kids, she didn't. And who knows how long it took, but gradually... Obviously, Elizabeth got to the place where her hope would have died, and she figured, you know, I, I, I'm past the age now. Uh, something must be wrong. I can't have a child. And at some point, the social stigma of her being called barren would have followed her wherever she went. And so, in all the, though she carried her emotional burden beneath the surface, she and Zachariah remained faithful to God. They didn't give up on God. They didn't stop following God. In fact, there's a cool little verse that I think would speak life to some of you this morning when things don't go your way. Luke 1.6 described them like this. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Both of them. Elizabeth, who was barren, and then Zachariah, who does his priestly duties, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. That, that's, that's a high praise for this couple. And then Gabriel shows up with this miraculous message. It seemed too good to be true, but soon she was pregnant saying, the Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So now she's pregnant. You know, she, her disgrace is taken away. And we know that in her six months of pregnancy, Elizabeth experienced a deep encounter with joy. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 41, that, that Mary came to visit. And Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb. You know, John the Baptist leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth greeted Mary with a beautiful blessing, saying, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is a child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So, so think about this. Jesus is already unleashing joy on the earth, and he's still in Mary's womb. That ought to tell you something about what the... Uh, shepherds finally said when Jesus was born that I bring you good times of great joy. So when Elizabeth gave birth to John three months later, the Bible says this in verse 57, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared in her joy. That's amazing. I love that. So we see that joy is life changing for, for, for Elizabeth. 
It overcomes shame and disgrace that she felt. The second thing that, that is so life-changing about joy is joy will overpower fear and anxiety. A lot of people are held captive by fear and by anxiety and worry, whatever words you want to put in there. It's hard to be joyful and anxious or joyful and fearful at the same time. And think about how Mary faced a lot of fear and anxiety with the birth of Jesus or with just the knowledge that she was going to have the Christ child. She could have been as young as 13 or 14. We don't know exactly. We know that she was a young woman. She, she's been told she's going to have a virgin birth. That's, that's the first and only that's ever been that way. She's already engaged to be married when she got pregnant. So, so she's pregnant and only engaged. That's a scandal in, in their time, and that could have been deathly consequences. God is the father. How is she going to communicate that to Joseph? Angel had to keep telling her over and over again, don't be afraid. But what I want to say, what I want you to think about this before I go on, when Mary was afraid, she still chose to trust God and accept his plan, even though she didn't totally understand it. So let me read part of the narrative from Luke 1. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled. See, here's the anxiety story. She was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. There it is. Mary, you have found favor with God. So what the angel said next created even more anxiety when he said, You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Then Mary asked the most obvious question, and Gabriel's answer created even greater anxiety. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Then she finally says, I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled, and the angel left her. Now, a takeaway here, just, you know, just when I say, you know, takeaway, just write this down, you know, hold on to this. If you're anxious about anything, the antidote is trust God and accept his plan. You are created and chosen for God's purposes, but you will miss it if you don't choose it. Eventually, Mary said in, in verses 46, 47, 48, she says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of a servant. So the result of accepting God's plan will always be joy. She wasn't sure at the beginning. She has fear and anxiety. She, she begins to just accept God's plan, even though she doesn't understand it, and it leads to her having joy in her life. So joy overcomes shame and disgrace. Joy overpowers fear and anxiety. And thirdly, joy overshadows hurt and resentment. So Mary struggles with this fear and anxiety. Joseph, now I'm just saying this because this is what I believe was going on. He struggled with hurt and resentment. He had every real reason to feel hurt, angry, wounded, betrayed. I mean, but you can't be resentful and joyful at the same time. And so we see that Joseph did not attack Mary. And it's hurt because he really loved her. I mean, I, I love talking about Joseph because he's an amazing man in the Bible. In fact, if, you, if there, you're ever in a Christmas play and, and you're asked to be, play the part of Joseph, you, you know, you're not going to win an Academy Award for that because we don't have one recorded word of anything that Joseph says in, in his whole life. But we have a whole lot of evidence of wonderful things that he does. So when Joseph was hurt, he chose to offer grace and let the pain go. You understand when I say he, he was hurt and felt, uh, you know, wounded and all this because he gets this news from Mary. Hey, I know I pledged to be married, but I'm pregnant. And Joseph is like, what? It's not from me. You know, well, it's from God. You know, you, you can understand what's going through his mind. Now, think about this. God could, the angel could have showed up to Mary and Joseph at the same time. Instead, God's testing their, their individual faith and character, and he's doing it separately. Matthew 1, verse 19 says, Because Joseph was faithful to the law, in other words, he was righteous, this is a good guy, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, which most every other guy would have done, by the way. They, they would have just thrown them under the bus, thrown them into that culture to be stoned or whatever. 
he had a mind to divorce her quietly. Now, I'm not going to get into why it says uses the word divorce here, but just to say that when they were engaged in their culture, that was pretty much everything that they were married except, you know, for the consummation of that marriage. So God tested Joseph and he let him try to decide what to do, but he did not, you know, leave Joseph in the dark for long. Understand, Joseph has got to deal with this. What am I going to do? And then the next verses tell us, but after he had considered this, considered to just, you know, deal with her gently and divorce her quietly, not to make a big stink about it. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Wow. So, so look at this. Joy overcomes shame and disgrace. Joy overpowers fear and anxiety. Joy will overshadow hurt and resentment. And all of this, all these scenarios have to do with just trusting God with his plan, even though you don't understand it. And here's the fourth thing. Joy offers guidance during times of confusion. You can look at this whole Christmas scenario and when Christ was born, there's a lot of confusion going on. You know, Mary, Joseph, you know, Zachariah, Elizabeth. And, and, and when we get to Matthew, it says, After Jesus was born at Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So the wise men had to deal with confusion over the direction, over following God's will or way, if you will. They knew something was happening, but not sure exactly where. They had to ask for direction. The key is this. When the wise men were confused, they chose to follow God's light one step at a time. A couple things about the wise men here I think are important. First of all, they're seekers of God. They travel all this way. They, they have gifts. We'll find out in a minute. Secondly, they were serious enough to invest time and energy. This was no small thing. You know, we always see in our, in our Christmas stories and plays that there's just three wise men, and we, we do that because there's three gifts, but uh, there's, no way or, there's no place in the Bible that says there were just three wise men. It just says the wise men, how many there were, brought three gifts. There, there was probably a big entourage, you know, you, you know, wise men traveling on camels, we always portray, but, but everybody else that was coming, all their servants bringing the food, supplies, whatever. So they, they invested time and energy to go seek this out. Thirdly, they headed out in faith with the light they were given. They went as far as they could. They stopped at the logical place where they thought the king of the Jews would be born, Jerusalem, and asked for directions. And the last thing I would just sneak in here is that seeking Jesus upsets people. Right? Did you, did you hear the end of that? When King Herod heard this about the king of the Jews, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And I would think, Jerusalem, why are they disturbed? They ought to be excited. They, they, they ought to jump right in and follow the wise men for the rest of their journey. See, here's what I know about our life. We, we want God to give us a map with our life all laid out, but he doesn't do that because, number one, it would scare you. Think of what you've already gone through in your life. If you would have known some of the things that you've gone through and had to deal with ahead of time, would you choose that? Probably not. And secondly, it would not require faith for us to follow God if we know how everything's going to work out. But see, God gives us a compass and a guide. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and he gives us his word. And in Psalm 119, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And I like to say that God's word is high beam and low beam. You know, sometimes we can only see the next step. And then, you know, those high beams, you know, it's a light to our path. We can at least see the direction. A takeaway here is, and this is important, don't wait to understand all the details of God's plan. Start the journey with the light or revelation God's already given you. Just take that step. Take that step and keep going. If you, if you get to a place like the wise men, you need to ask directions, which means you might need to, to ask a friend, a pastor. You might need to spend some prayer time and fasting to, to discern God's next step for you. Do it, but don't delay getting started until you get it all figured out because that, that's not going to happen. Then in Matthew it goes on to say, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Well, that's, he's not telling the truth there. You know that. We know the rest of the story. 
he wanted to know where the child was so that he could kill uh, that child. And, and since he couldn't kill that child, he killed all the babies two years old and under, according to how long the wise men had been traveling, which was like two years. Then check this out. Verses 9, 10, 11. After they had heard the king, they went in their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, guess what? They were overjoyed. There's that word joy again, overjoyed. And then verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I just want to pause here and say, Notice what true worship looks like. They presented themselves first and then their gifts. You know, a lot of times we think God just wants, you know, wants a little bit of our time. He wants us to show up at church and, you know, put our offering in the plate and those kind of things. Listen, yeah, that should be part of what we want to do and we get to do. But more than anything, he wants us. I, I, I love this little thing that gets overlooked. They bowed down and worshiped him. They presented themselves first. Then they gave him the gifts that they brought. So listen here. Joy is life changing because it overcomes shame and disgrace. It overpowers fear and anxiety. It overshadows hurt and resentment. And joy gives, gives guidance amid confusion. So if you're anxious today, Mary and Elizabeth teach us to trust God and accept his plan. When Joseph was hurt, he chose to offer grace and let the, let the pain go. The wise men were confused, but they chose to follow God's light one step at a time. And so today, you might need to pray what David prayed in Psalm 51. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So first of all, joy is life-changing. The second big thing about joy is it defies our circumstances. And I want you to remember that it defies our circumstances. You know, it's like things happen to us that should take away our joy, that cause us problems and all these things, shame and fear and anxiety and disgrace. You know, life does that to us. Guess what? J joy life laughs in the midst of all that. It, it, it f flows deep even in the face of a challenge or hardship or suffering because joy is drawn from Jesus. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what James says. James chapter 1, consider pure joy. Joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, so we can have joy when we understand that God is at work, even especially during tough times. But there's a process involved as we immerse ourselves in God's word, as we align our thinking, you know, with his ways, we will experience the Holy Spirit working in us, producing that fruit, bringing us clarity, understanding, strength, so that, so that we can live the way that we need to live as joyful Christians. I wonder what the circumstances you're facing right now. Can I encourage you just to ask God to show you his big picture, to, to bring joy into your life? You may not experience a miracle like Elizabeth or Mary, but, but it's possible. But, but there, there are miracles for all of us. God is a miraculous working God. You know, the miracle of God coming to earth to be with us, to heal us, to forgive us, to redeem all of our pain, to turn it into good. Th this is a cause of joy for all of us. And we should realize this at Christmas time. So this was the message of the angel long ago that I mentioned in Luke chapter 2, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So joy is a birthright for all of us as Christians. Every child of God ought to have considerable joy. Every child of God ought to have conspicuous joy. Conspicuous joy. Every child of God ought to have continuous joy and contagious joy. It should be something that is known about us. And I would say here today that, that if you are not living a life of joy, then you're living beneath your privilege as a Christian. Maybe it's because you're trying to carry the weight of your problems and figure this all out yourself and you don't have to. Pastor and author John Piper says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. 
So all through scripture, Jesus' ministry was characterized by joy. When he sent the 72 followers out to preach the coming of the kingdom and to heal the sick, it says they returned with joy. When Jesus was resurrected, it says the disciples and women who were following him were filled with joy. The Bible says the new church that formed in, in Jerusalem worshipped with great joy. When speaking of the church, as Paul would often write in his letters, whenever I pray for you, I pray with great joy. The Bible says in Luke 15 that every time one person puts their faith in Christ, there's joy and rejoicing in heaven. A lot of people think that following Christ is all about rules. But Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace. Guess what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. So what I'm saying here, the deeper you get rooted and established in Christ, the more righteousness, peace, and joy you're going to have. So joy is life-changing, and I explain why. Joy defies our circumstances. And number three, Jesus is our source of joy. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. What's, how is that possible to always be joyful? Here's the key. In the Lord. In the Lord. That phrase, in the Lord, is used 167 times in the New Testament. And every time it says in Christ, it's going to show you a benefit of what it means to be in Christ. There's a benefit because of it for putting our faith in Christ, for loving Christ, for following Christ, for being part of the family of Christ. And the key to the Christian joy is its source which is the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ is in me and I am him, there is always a reason for joy. The joy that Mary and Joseph, Zachariah, Elizabeth, the shepherds, the wise men experience. Listen, friends, it's available to us. That, that, the story of Christ is still going on. The, the apostle Peter wrote, though you have not seen him, you love him. That's us. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, we love to be happy. We love to feel good. But happiness comes and goes, right? I mean, happiness can come for, from a birthday party, from gifts, for your favorite song, you know, from encouraging message from a friend, winning the big game, a delicious meal. They're, they're great things, but they're momentary. You know, they come and then they go. But joy includes happiness, but, but it runs much deeper. That, that's why, you know, it, it's more than, than just a gift. It permeates our souls. It looks, uh, you know, at the wonderful things that the Lord has done and is doing in our life. It's rooted in gratitude, rooted in meaning and hope based in our relationship with Christ. It's like Peter called it an inexpressible and glorious joy. Paul called it an indescribable gift that we have in Christ. And like Nehemiah of the Old Testament, the Jewish leader who faced great odds in rebuilding the walls, we can experience the truth that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is life-changing. Joy defies our circumstances. Jesus is the source of our joy. And finally, before I close, I want to tell you one more thing. Joy is a choice. Joy is a choice. It would be great if we felt joyful all the time, but the truth is there are barriers to our joy that try to block it from getting in our life. There are depleters of joy that just drain it. This is life we live. There are enemies of joy that fight against us being joyful. There's destroyers of joy that steal the joy God wants you to have. And have you noticed what I meant when I said that at Christmas, joy shows up everywhere? And not just at Christmas, but it's all throughout the scripture. It's a profound, compelling quality of life that transcends our events and circumstances which can trouble us. I said it is. It's a fruit of God's spirit. It's a divine dimension of living that's not shackled by our circumstances. The Hebrew word means to leap or spin around with pleasure. It's what I see my grandkids doing and other kids doing. You know, and kids, you know, they have joy. In the New Testament, the word refers to gladness, bliss, and celebration. And the revival of Jesus was the most joyful event in history. And how, how dare we take Christmas and just make it about, you know, gifts under a tree and, and all these other things that, you know, if the world does that, then, then they're missing out. But beloved, listen, we, we better make sure that we keep it right. Remember when Mary showed up at Elizabeth's house? Elizabeth was overcome with joy. And then Mary's expression went like this, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of a servant from now on all generations will call me blessed. The key word there being rejoices. 
It's the active verb form of joy. In other words, Mary is choosing and embracing the role she has been given by God, and she's choosing joy. Joseph chose joy. And, and I'm asking you in your situation now, whatever it might be, choose joy. Embrace the gift of joy. Align your vision with, with what God's doing in your life, whether you understand it or not. If you, you wait to get it all figured out, it's not going to happen. Let me ask you, when did Mary and Joseph get all this figured out? They're just surprised every, everywhere they go. They, they finally get to Bethlehem. They have the baby. You know, everything there did not work out right. These shepherds come. You, know, you, you read the account, and, and they, they're just wondering what is going on. Romans 12, 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Matt Redmond has written a song called Help from Heaven. It says, there's a moment every heart needs a rescue. There's a season every soul needs a breakthrough. Help from heaven. We all need help from heaven. When the world is on our shoulders and we need a hand to hold us, when no miracle is found, still believe. When the sea of night surrounds us and all questions try to drown us, just believe. Just believe in help from heaven. I wonder, today, have you lost your joy? Then you need help from heaven. And that help was found in Jesus Christ. So let's celebrate this wonderful gift that's more than just a gift of happiness. It's more than just things going our way, man. It is something deep and wonderful that can transcend all the events of our life. Let's pray. And I've written a prayer that, that I just would, would think that maybe some of you, are, you, you might be thinking in your own life. And God, I don't want to live a joyless, joyless life. But I've let anxiety and hurt, resentment and confusion, a lot of other things steal my joy. This, this Christmas, I need help from heaven. Thank you for sending Jesus to be my savior. I don't understand it all, but like Mary, I'm gonna choose to trust and accept your plan for my life. And like Joseph, I need you to fill me with your grace so that I can let go of pain and things that have hurt me and don't go through life angry. I want the joy of the Lord to be my strength. And like the wise men, I want to follow the light that you give me one step at a time. Thank you, Lord, that this is your plan for our life, to replace all the garbage that we let in and allow room for the joy, the wonderful fruit of the Spirit to grow and grow and grow. And I pray that it does today in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Well, one more time, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. You can also go to our website, eagrm.org. We would love to hear from you and get you connected with our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next week, as we come back together for another great weekend of online church. We look forward to having you join us. And so, until we see each other again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Merry Christmas!